Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Today's guest is Marshall Grant. Marshall played bass with Johnny Cash in the Tennessee Two. And actually, it was Marshall and Luther that let Johnny join their band in the beginning when they were mechanics in Memphis. I went to Memphis a few years ago, and this is part of that, that video uh, where we went to all the pertinent places that had anything to do with the creation of Johnny Cash in the Tennessee Two. In this particular clip, we go to Marshall's house. He still owned the house that he owned when they, he was a mechanic. And we tour the house, and he tells things as minute as where Luther plugged his amp into the wall. And another bonus is that he actually lived about two houses away from Elvis's second house and talks about hearing the girls screaming in front of Elvis's house. It's a fun video. I hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Today's guest, Marshall Grant. This house behind me here is the first house that Ed and I ever bought. Uh, we bought it in 1953. This is where John and Luther and I worked in this den in here and put all the original songs that was recorded on Sun together. Happened right in here. When we used to travel so much, of course, we drove like over the speed limit all the time and it was hard on cars. And one weekend we'd go out and we'd take Luther's car, one weekend we'd go out and we'd take my car, and the middle weekend we'd go out and we'd take John's old 1954 Plymouth, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. But when they failed on us, and especially John's car, uh, I would bring it right here, under this carport, and I'd do whatever was necessary. Could I overhaul the motors here? I'd ground the valves here? i overhaul the brake system here, transmissions, whatever. Because we didn't have, you know, money wasn't flowing like it does now if you got a couple number one records. It was pretty tight for us. So, me being a mechanic, there was senseless for us to spend the money that we didn't have to take it to the shop to get repaired. So whatever needed to be done to the cars was done right here, right here at this, not at this table, but in the table that sat right here is when we were in the den playing and acting up and so forth. The girls, Vivian, Bertie, Etta, would sit right here at another table, not this table, and they would play what they call Rook. And they had a lot of fun. But in this room right in here is where it all, I've said many times on this tape, is where it all began. But right in here is where the sound was literally born. And I'll take you in here and we'll show you what happened. Of course, there's no furniture in this room yet, but I still own the furniture. I just don't have it in this house. And there was a couch that sat right there, and a chair that sat right here. The receptacle that Luther plugged his little amplifier into was right there. And John would always sit on the end of this couch right here. And when we were all playing rhythm guitars, well, then I would sit over there. John would sit right here. And Luther would sit over here with the receptacle. And then one night, after we changed instruments up a little bit, and I started playing bass, and John remained there, I stood right here between them, played my bass, John sat there, and, and then we just started this thing. And when, when we, we didn't even, we didn't even know how to tune this bass. But one night I remember when we was going to, the first night after I started playing the bass, John had the worst old guitar that you could possibly ever imagine. Is he some, had a guitar he paid five dollars for in Germany. And he looked up at me sitting on the couch and he said, Marshall, if you're going to play the bass, could I use your guitar? And I had a little Triple Alt 28 Martin that Ed had gave me for my birthday present about five years earlier. And I said, sure. So I reached over here and got it and handed it to him. And he strummed a couple chords and said, wow. And uh, so that's the guitar that we used to write Hayborn, 
Cry, 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 Frozen Prison Blues, I Walked the Line. It was the guitar that he, that every song that we recorded on Sun, he used that little guitar of mine, which of course I still have. But then as time went along and what he could afford to get it, his own guitar, which was about 1957, then he bought his own Martin. And I, I honestly don't know of any other act, and maybe there is another one, where it all happened in one little spot, not in the studio, but in one little spot right here, and then you go to, to the studio and put it on tape. But that's what we did. And why did we do it that way? Because we weren't musicians. I was a mechanic, Luther was a mechanic, John was an appliance salesman. Three good friends that, were, that, that loved music. And so we started below the bottom and went past the top. When John Luther and I would go out of town for a couple of days on tour, Vivian, his first wife, and her children, however many she had, at first it was Roseanne, then Catherine, then Cindy, and Terry was born in California, but the three of them was born here in Memphis. Well, they would all come over here and stay with Etta while we were gone. When we got to, uh, all these instruments tuned up and we was playing a little bit, and we decided that we were going to want to try to get on record, then we wondered what we was going to call ourselves. And John one night, he said, well, you know, he said, since Luther was born in Mississippi, and you were born in North Carolina, being me, and me, I was born in Arkansas, he said, why don't we call ourselves the Tennessee Three? I thought, hey, that's a pretty good name. So to, in the beginning, uh, we called ourselves the Tennessee Three because we were equal part. It's like the Oak Ridge Boys, the Stoutler Brothers, Larry Gatlin, Alabama, you know. It would be just, they're three and they're four and so forth and so on, but it's the same arrangement. And so uh, we, we called ourselves the Tennessee Three. But when we went in and recorded our first record, which is Hey Porter and Cry Cry Cry, as I've said many times. Sam Phillips said, John, one day and I wasn't present, but John come down to the shop, down at Auto Sales, and he called Luther and I up there, and he said, say, I want to run this by you guys, but I just left Sam, and instead of calling ourselves the Tennessee Three, he feels it'd be better if we called ourselves Johnny Cash, and at this point, he had never been called Johnny Cash. He said a good stage name would be Johnny Cash and the Tennessee Two. And he said to both of us, what do you guys think? I said, well, what do you think? I said, maybe that's appropriate. You do, you're doing the lead singing now. We're no longer a duet. We're not doing the gospel stuff. Evidently, we're going to go down the commercial path with regular country song. And he said, well, I don't have no problem with it. I'll go with it either way. And I said, Luther, what do you think? He said, I think that's a good idea. So at that point, we changed their name to Johnny Cash and the Tennessee Two. And it lived that way for years and years and years. And we finally hired a drummer. And then we went to t back to the Tennessee Three. But uh, in the beginning, in the very beginning, and we played a few dates under the name Tennessee Three after we did the church, very small dates, some, whatever we scramble up. We were, we were billed as the Tennessee Three. Legal and technically, we were three partners. Yeah. And uh, we could feel when that was falling apart. And if John had, first of all, John would have never done away with all the money had he stayed straight. Because he was a fair, honest man. Really, believe me, when he was straight. But as, as a dear, dear friend of mine said one time, that knew him pretty well, another entertainer uh, was talking about it and he said well he just figured that he needed the money worse than y'all did and i said yeah you're right we needed some though to exist on and it was hard to come by but uh this is the uh, what we call the master bedroom but being a master bedroom doesn't compare the one we have now or what other people have this is house was built back in the 50s and i used to See, Elvis lives on the next street over there on Audubon before Graceland would, came about. And we could lay here at night in the bed and hear the girls screaming over there for Elvis. This car is one John gave me in 1985, I think it was. The story behind this car is, is 
As I've said before, one weekend we'd go in his car, one weekend we'd go in Luther's car, one weekend we'd go in my car. John had a 1954 Plymouth, not this car, but one just exactly like it. So after he disposed of it many years ago, Chrysler Corporation somehow found out that he owned a 1954 Plymouth car to start our touring in. And so they set out to find him a new one to give to him. But he, uh, they found this one up in Indiana and it had, uh, let me see if I can get that door open. And at the time they found it, it had 9,000 miles on it. So John, uh, June, and I went up to the Indianapolis Airport. Crosser Corporation presented it to him. And I had it sent by a carrier to his house in Hendersonville. And, uh, and one day in 1985, he called me and he said, this little thing's getting in my way. And he said, I think you'd appreciate it more than anybody else. And he said, and I don't want to sell it, but if you want it, come up and pick it up. So I did. I went up and picked it up, did very little work to it to get it running. And it's sitting here idling right now. It's got 14,500 actual, very actual miles on it. The only thing that's ever been changed on it, as you can tell, he, he wanted some white sidewall tires on it. And so, so we, uh, he, he himself put a white sidewall tires on it. And it's still registered in his name, and it always will be. I'll, I'll never take it out and put it in, in my name. Of course, El Elvis lived right here. But the address is 1034, Waterman. And, and across these houses where we just left was my house. It's actually one block apart, but if you go right across through there, it's, oh, 150 yards, I guess. And used to in the afternoon, especially in the afternoon, when Elvis was home, the girls and other people would line up right across this the sidewalk there. And Elvis, would, when he was in town, would sort of tantalize them. He'd run out the door and wave at him and then dart back in, and then he'd come out another door and he'd wave at him, dart back in. And, uh, and he'd do that sometimes, and they would holler and scream, and I could hear him over at my house. Some of the neighbors complained about that. But I thought it was great. But of course, I'm, I was a block away. It didn't really matter. It bothered me as much as it did, say, this neighbor or this neighbor here. But, uh, you know, this is the second house that he had after he... Uh, the first house that he had is uh, down here on Getwell, and they tore it down for a convenience store. And they sold the bricks, and they sold the mortar, and they sold all parts of that for charity. But this is the last house that he had before he moved to Graceland. And of course, that's where he lived until he died. And, and uh, so Mike Curb from Curb Record has bought this house. I don't really know what he intends to do with it, but it's like mine. It's sitting empty, so maybe Mike just wants to keep it the way I keep mine. Uh, because of the history that's in it, I don't know. I, I haven't spoken to Mike about that, but I'm proud to, that he has it.